of the things that we do in our staff meetings every week, we meet on Mondays, and one of the things that we do at the beginning of every meeting is we just take time to celebrate. And so uh, you may not know this, we've probably celebrated you at some point. We often celebrate those who serve, those who lead groups, those who invest, uh, you know, in, in the community, sharing the gospel, whatever it might be, we just celebrate those things, celebrating what God is doing in lives and baptisms and, and all of that. And one of the things that's just been on my heart lately that I've just been thanking God for and celebrating is the unity that we enjoy in this church. Uh, unity is not something that I take for granted. I've been a part of churches. Uh, I, y'all, I grew up in this church. I've been in this church at, at times where unity was not present. Uh, but it's a beautiful thing that we get to see here. And, and listen, it's not just me. We hear about unity among our elders, like they talk about the unity that we have. Uh, we hear it among our staff and even visiting with some of you. It's just, it is a breath of fresh air to not have to fight and have dissensions and factions. And uh, as a pastor, I don't feel any need to play to various political things. Like that doesn't happen here. And we just thank God for the unity that we get to enjoy um, and, it, and if you've been on the other side of that, you might be here today and you're, and you're bearing the scars of being a part of a church that at times might have been disunified. They might have experienced the, the difficulty that comes with division. Maybe you've been wounded somewhere in the process and maybe that was a long time ago and maybe that's been more recent for you. Uh, but you could attest to the pain that comes uh, when there are divisions within the church. Um, I talk about that because division was something that was happening in the church in Galatia. Uh, if, if you weren't here or you're, you know, this is your first week in this series, The Grace Effect, with us, um, the situation in Galatia was that some false teachers had come into those churches and they'd been calling into question the Apostle Paul's, um, whether or not he was sent, and then questioning the gospel that he'd been teaching. And basically what they wanted to do was say, hey, um, we believe the gospel, saved by faith in Jesus Christ, um, but we also want to add keeping the works of the law to that. So you need to have faith in Jesus, you need to believe the gospel, but you also need to be a good Jew. And so they were bringing that into the church in Galatia, and it was causing a lot of confusion. So the, the church of Galatia didn't grow up like we did, okay? Uh, they had never heard the gospel before. This is just a, a region, Christianity. It starts in Jerusalem and it begins to kind of emanate out from there. The apostle Paul had come through and he preached the gospel. They heard it for the very first time that Jesus Christ had died on the cross for their sins that they might be saved. And men and women there, they believed the gospel. They were saved. They experienced the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. The church was born. There must have been incredible joy among these individuals in Galatia. Now, as the Apostle Paul did, because he, he traveled and he went and planted churches all over, he left the church at Galatia behind, began preaching in other places. And when he did, some false teachers had come in and they said, hey, uh, by the way, we've been spending time with the apostles, with some really influential men in Jerusalem, which again, epicenter of Christianity, that's where Pentecost happened and all of this started. They were like, yeah, and you know, Paul, he just didn't really get it right. And it is, you do want to believe faith in Jesus Christ, but you also, you need to undergo circumcision. You need to become a good Jew and observe the various feasts and festivals and the Sabbaths. And it was creating a lot of controversy and confusion for people, particularly because they were like, Paul isn't a real apostle. And his gospel isn't the real gospel. You can imagine there would have been division. Those who loved Paul and they'd experienced the power of the Spirit and, and yet those who were beginning to follow these false teachers. It was a painful time for the church at Galatia. Read with me here in Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. By the way, just so you know where we're picking up, Paul has been defending his apostleship. I was sent by Jesus and his gospel. I got it from Jesus himself. I didn't learn it from men. I didn't go into Jerusalem to be taught the gospel. He's like, I did meet with Peter and James once, but not to learn the gospel. And, and so in Galatians 2 verse 1, he says, then after 14 years, he's like, I've been preaching all over the known world this gospel for 14 years and after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them though privately before those who seemed influential I set before them the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running and had not run in vain. And so Paul um, seeking the unity of the church he's 
He's an apostle. He knows the gospel. But he's traveling to Jerusalem after 14 years because he wants to set this controversy to rest. He wants to be done with it. And so today, what I want us to look at is how do we as a church protect and preserve the unity that we enjoy? How do we make sure that we don't fall into divisions and factions and, and fighting? Um, so we're going to look at, at two things today, just two points for you. The first is this, unity requires us to be peacemakers and not peace fakers. Y'all know the difference, right, uh, between a, a peacemaker and a peace faker. A peacemaker is someone who is willing to confront when there is an issue, when something goes on. And let me just tell you, um, if you're in a church and you've never had an issue with anybody, you're in a church full of fakers, right? We're humans. Uh, we sin against one another. If you're in this church very long with me, at some point, I'm going to sin against you. And peacemakers say, you know what? I'm going to follow the words of Jesus. I'm going to go have a conversation with him. I'm going to show him how he sinned against me and give him the opportunity to repent that we might be reconciled. Peace fakers are like, eh, no, it's okay. That's a little uncomfortable. Gets a little awkward having to call the pastor out when he sins against you. I think I'm just going to overlook it. And what happens with sin when it's hidden, when it's kept in the darkness, is it doesn't go away. It actually grows. And it doesn't just affect you, but it's going to begin to affect other people. And this is how churches are destroyed. Like you look historically, churches are rarely destroyed from the outside, but instead it often happens from within. The Apostle Paul, in writing this letter to the churches in Galatia, he is choosing the role of being a peacemaker. Um, he's making peace in the midst of their division by calling them to unite around what is true, right? There's some confusion about what the gospel is. And Paul's like, I'm going to lay it out very clearly for you. This is a gospel and this is not. He's making peace among the people. Now, let's be honest. Um, he is an apostle. He's planting churches all over the known world. He's busy receiving beatings. He's been stoned. He's been shipwrecked. Like, why in the world would the apostle Paul take the time to write a letter to the churches in Galatia? I believe it's because he knew what was at stake. He, he knew the value of unity in the church, and he understood the dangers of division. Look, look what he says here in verse 4. He's presented his, his gospel to the, the brothers in Jerusalem, um, which, by the way, they were with him for the most part. But there were some false teachers. Verse 4, he says, Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. He's like, okay, so in Christ, we have freedom on the one hand, right? What right now, we are in freedom, but the problem is when we allow false teaching, when we allow division to go on in the church, you know what that brings? Slavery. Paul's like, listen, I can't bear to let that sort of thing happen. I've seen these men and women come to faith in Jesus. I want them to experience God's rich. I want them to experience the freedom that comes from the gospel and not slavery that comes from believing a false gospel. And because of that, because the stakes were high, Paul decides he's going to enter into the mess that's happening among the churches in Galatia. He's going to write a letter and he's going to confront the false teaching that exists. Now, how unloving would it have been of Paul, knowing what was at stake, freedom versus slavery, to think, you know, I'm, I'm kind of busy. You know, I've got some things going on in my life. I'm just not going to, I'm just not going to engage here. I'm going to let them handle it. How unloving would that be? But then we think about that more personally. How unloving would it be for us? To see things going awry in the lives of people that we love, that we call brothers and sisters in Christ in this church, and just to ignore those things and be like, ah, it's not a problem to fake peace rather than to make peace. Jesus, in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37, he tells a story of the Good Samaritan. You, if you grew up in church, you probably know this one, but I'm going to read it for you. He says this, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. They weren't just after his, like his money, I guess. They wanted his clothes. They stripped him, which is humiliating, right? They leave him here half dead on the side of the road. But there's good news, y'all. You know the story. There's good news because now by chance, think about this. This must have been a divine moment, right? By chance, a priest was going down that road. 
Y'all, this is the making of a beautiful testimony, right? I got beaten by robbers and left for dead, and there was a priest just by chance walking down that road. And so we would anticipate that the priest is going to enter in and fix it, right? Except for that's, that's not what happens. By chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. That's unexpected. He's literally a priest. It's kind of his job, right? Verse 32, so likewise a Levite. Oh, okay, I get it. These are the people that serve in the temple of God, like, you know, they're of that tribe. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. And then verse 33 the least likely person that you would ever expect to help if you were a good Jew, the last person that you thought would ever help you, um, a Samaritan comes. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He had the heart of, of God, the least likely person, had compassion. And this is what compassion led him to do. He went to him, And he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and he he gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So we have a man who's in really bad shape. He'd been robbed and beaten and stripped and left for dead. And all the religious people, the peace fakers in the story, they walked by on the other side of the road. They saw the wreck. They saw the man there in an awful situation. He's in the ditch. And they walked by on the other side of the road. Maybe they figured, ah, you know, a few hours, he'll, he'll wake up. You know, maybe he can crawl his way out. He'll figure this out on his own. And maybe he'll learn a lesson not to fall in the hands of robbers. Maybe they thought he was too far gone. He'd been, he was half dead at least, so they thought, it's not worth the time or the energy. He's too far gone. Maybe they thought someone else would do it. Whatever the reasoning, the priest and the Levite couldn't be bothered to intervene on this man's behalf. Compassion and mercy didn't motivate them to get in the middle of this guy's mess. To do so would have been costly of their time and their energy and their money, And it may have even put them at risk from the same robbers that had beaten the man. But the Samaritan had compassion and showed him mercy, bearing the cost to bring him back to health. The Samaritan acknowledged that he was alone and in a ditch, and he needed someone to intervene. Now, there's no indication in the story whether the man in the ditch was crying out for help. If he's there half dead, he may have been unconscious and even unaware of what was going on. It took initiative on the part of the Samaritan to go to him and to help. So the Samaritan goes and binds up his wounds, puts him on his donkey, pays for his costs. Church, that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus found us dead, not just half dead, fully dead in our trespasses and sins and spared not his own life to make us whole. He paid the price to bring us to peace with God. Matthew chapter 5, 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Like, that's what we're supposed to be. But then Jesus demonstrated uh, what that would look like for us by offering himself on the cross for our sins. Because of our sin, we had enmity with God. Our sin caused division. It caused separation between us and God. But Jesus spared not his own life in pursuit of our peace. He willingly went to the cross that we might have peace with God, and that is just beautiful for us Jesus died that we might have life, that we might have peace with God and enjoy a life with him. Now, there's an important point I want to make here as we think about the difference between a peacemaker and a peace faker. Jesus was willing to lay down his own life, but he was not willing to compromise on what was true. 
Okay, I'm going to say that again because we live in America, right? Um, Jesus was willing to lay down his life, but he wasn't willing to compromise what was true. He wasn't going to fake peace. He wasn't going to pretend we were right with God while we were still uh, separated because of our sins. He wasn't going to call our sin good. He wasn't going to overlook it or ignore it, but he was willing to bear the cost of our sin. He didn't ignore our sin. He didn't call it good in the name of faking peace. He made peace between us and God, willing enduring unimaginable suffering in order to make peace. And Jesus, who is our peacemaker, has now called us to be peacemakers in the world in which we live, certainly in the church in which we reside in. He called us to enter into the discomfort of the pain and the brokenness of others, seeking that they might be made whole. One of our core values of community here at Cross Community Church is that we want to admonish one another faithfully. It's admonish. It just means that if we see something in your life, and I'm not talking about you have a bad day, but we see you're, you're in the ditch or you're headed that way. We see something broken in your life. We're going to speak up and we're going to say something um, because Proverbs 27, 6 says this, faithful are the wounds of a friend. We love, one enough, we love one another enough to intervene when we see your life getting off track. And that's exactly what Paul is doing for the church in Galatia. He's being a peacemaker, confronting what is false and teaching what is true. When we're willing to confront sin in the lives of our fellow church members, what we're doing is demonstrating the same mercy and compassion, the peacemaking that Jesus has called us Two, and many people want to fake peace because they think it's too costly to make it. Y'all know what I mean. I don't, I don't know about you, but anytime I've had to have one of these conversations with somebody, I, I can know the cost on the front end. Like, it's going to be hard. Things are going to get awkward. We don't like to confront one another here. It's a really difficult thing, right? Uh, man, I, what if it damages the relationship? What if they're angry with me? What if they go out in the community and they talk bad about that person from that church who dared to confront their sin? We know the cost, Right? But Paul reminds us that the cost of not confronting, of faking peace, are far greater. Whereas confronting, whereas peacemaking leads to freedom, peace faking leaves them in slavery, right? And we would be unloving and foolish to leave people there. So how do we, how do we maintain and preserve unity in the body? We have to follow Jesus being peacemakers and not peace fakers. And number two... Unity requires of us humble submission to one another under God and his word. I wish that was pithier. I, I, I don't know. It's not the best uh, point ever, but I, I'll break it out for you. I want to read it again. Unity requires humble submission to one another under God and his word. So just to be very clear, the Apostle Paul, he was an apostle who had been called by Jesus Christ himself. Jesus had given Paul his gospel. He didn't need anyone to back himself up, right? He wasn't confused. He wasn't uncertain like, ah, oh, you know, I've been doing this for 14 years. I heard it from Jesus, but maybe I've messed it up. But what the Apostle Paul was willing to do was to demonstrate the humble submission that he wanted to see among the people in the churches of Galatia. He was setting an example of what it looked like to submit yourself one to another. Galatians chapter 2, verse 2. I went up because of a revelation and set before them the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. And so he goes up to these men, influential men in Jerusalem, and he lays out his gospel in full. He's got Titus with him, who is a Greek, who has not been circumcised. Lays out the gospel, and none of the men there among the influential group um, said, oh yeah, Titus, you, if you're going to hang out with us, you got to be circumcised, because you, it's not just the gospel, it's the gospel plus being a good Jew. None of them did that, except there were a few false men. And one of the big dangers, and this might be what you feel when I talk about humbly submitting yourself to one another, you might be like, what about when they get it wrong? How do I know who to submit to, when to submit, and when to, to not? Like, what if someone tells me something that's crazy? Well, that's why I say that unity requires humble submission to one another under God and His Word. 
The influential men, as he says in verse 3, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Then he had a group of people that are like, you're doing it right, Paul. You got the gospel. It's clear. Like, you're, you're killing it. Keep running the race. You're running. But there was a group of false teachers secretly brought in who wanted to lead them not to the true gospel and freedom, who wanted to lead them back in slavery. And what he says in verse 5 is he said, To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment. How do we know in the church, if we're going to submit ourselves to one another, how do we know who to submit to and what to submit to and what if they get it wrong? Well, here, here's the thing. This is important for you to understand. Um, what governs our submission to one another, it's not someone's opinion, it is the word of God. Like, that is the final word on everything. And if the, the word teaches it, right, if the word is clear, we submit ourselves to the word. Now, if you're sitting out there and you think, well, it's not like Paul rolled into Jerusalem with his New Testament, leather bound, you know, on his hip. Like, there wasn't a New Testament, right? Well, what Paul did was submit himself to those through whom God transmitted the New Testament, the apostles. He comes into the city, he submits himself to the men, there's a division, and he goes to the very apostles themselves. Look with me in verse 6. He said, And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. From those guys, um, those who seemed influential, they added nothing. They didn't say the gospel plus being a good Jew. They didn't, it's not the gospel plus circumcision or obeying the Sabbath. They affirmed me. Now, there were false teachers. Those were there. So here's what Paul did. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, um, I'm going to skip down to verse 9. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. He goes to the very apostles themselves. And they affirmed both his apostleship and his gospel. In the same way that Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the Jews, they saw that Paul had been entrusted with the gospel to the Gentiles. When we find ourselves in a situation, maybe it's a disagreement in our church, what we don't want to do is just fake it and allow that to remain covered up and hoping it's going away. It ain't going away. It's going to get worse, right? What we want to do is to be peacemakers. And we come to one another humbly confronting the issue, lovingly confronting the issue, and willingly submitting ourselves to one another. We come and we submit ourselves to one another under the word of God. We're not terribly interested in anyone's opinion, right? We, can, you know, we, we could all differ in a lot of ways. But when it comes to the places where the word of God speaks, we listen and we don't talk back. That's, that is our approach. So how are we going to maintain and preserve unity in this body? We need you to be a peacemaker and not a peace faker. Anybody here an avoider in your marriage? You're the one that you got an issue and you're like, I don't want to talk about it. It's uncomfortable. I'm not sure. Like, right? I'm talking to you. Okay. We need you to be a peacemaker and not a peace faker. Like, I need you to get in it and submit yourself to the word because you might be wrong. It's true of all of us. And we need you to humbly submit yourselves to one another under God's word. Um, what we ask of everyone in our church, and I just want to encourage you as your pastor today, is that you would live life in community. As a matter of fact, if you're in our church and you're not a part of a community group, your experience here, it's not going to be great. I, I, I fear that you're not going to get what you need from the church. Um, the place where we are going to care for one another, like watching out for one another, a place where we're going to disciple one another. Our, one of our values, we say, we bet the farm on community. That's how we make disciples. We say, live in community with other believers around the word, encourage and exhort one another, and watch what God does, right? I don't have any illusions that my preaching is the trick to you growing as a believer, but I do think you walking day in and day out with other committed believers who will point you back to his word when things get difficult, that's going to help you grow. And, and so in community, we say, we want you to admonish one another faithfully. But the, the other side of that, the second thing, is we want you to counsel one another biblically. You might have experienced a time in your life, or maybe you were just struggling with who you are in Christ. 
And you, you buy the lie that Satan would wish to tell you that you're, you're not worthy, that, that you have no business serving God in his church. Who are you to walk around the community acting like a Christian? You know where you've been. And someone gets to come and quote Romans to you and say, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? They're speaking the word over you and reminding you of who the scripture says that you are and what Jesus has done for you. We all need that in our lives. Unity requires us to be peacemakers and not peace fakers. It requires humble submission to one another. Y'all, uh, I'm going to show you a picture here. We have been blessed to be in community with William and Taylor Green. I think it's been seven years now. And man, I hope someday you get to hear the story about what God has done in them, how he has worked in their marriage, that it is just beautiful. I hope that you have that opportunity. I'd love to have them stand on the stage and tell it someday. Um, we're, by the way, <clears throat> I put this picture up here because Taylor and Will had an anniversary this week. And in our community group message, she posted this picture and was like, hey, do y'all remember when Jason had color in his hair instead of just the gray? So <clears throat> I thought I might uh, get back at her uh, just a little bit. But listen, I deeply value Will and Taylor's friendship. And it's not just because they bless and encourage us. And, and they often do but it's because they've been willing to be peacemakers in our lives. It's because they've been willing to speak into my marriage when things weren't going so well. They've been willing to listen and to point us to the word. It's because they've been willing to speak into my own life when they saw sin beginning to, to creep in or I might be flirting with something. They've been willing to speak back to us. And y'all, we are not friends in spite of the fact that they have been peacemakers. We are greater friends with a deeper friendship precisely because they've been willing to be peacemakers in our lives. We are uh, profoundly and eternally grateful for those difficult conversations where they were willing to, to enter in to the difficulty and the awkwardness of having a conversation with a pastor about how he needs to repent, right? But that's how we maintain unity. And that's how we gain the depth and the connectedness that we need to have in the body of Christ. Can, can I just ask you a question? Who has permission to play peacemaker in your life? Who have you invited into your life to admonish you? I know it's Labor Day weekend. You might not be meeting with your group this week, you know, but next week when you get back. Can I just encourage you to ask two or three questions similar to these? Ask questions of your group. Hey, what do you see in me that may not be pleasing to the Lord? Do I have a tendency to gossip? Do I treat my spouse in a way that doesn't honor Christ? Are my business practices honoring to the Lord? What do you see in me that may not be pleasing? Where do you see that I might be getting off track and headed for a ditch? Where do you see that I'm failing to live in accordance with God's word? And I encourage you to listen. And, and again, surrender yourself to God and his word. If they're on track with the word... Heed it, right? Repent, turn, whatever it is. If they're off track, it's okay. Let it roll off your back. There are people that love you enough to intervene when they see you headed for a ditch. Now, today, we have the, the great privilege of celebrating communion together. And one of the things that we're celebrating when we receive communion is the unity that we share as we're all partakers of the body and the blood of Christ. This is Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 and 28. It says, For as many, of you, as, as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. You're not the old you. you just, you've now been clothed in Christ. He says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave, nor free. There's no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. In Christ Jesus, we're no longer divided by the things of this world, but are united in our common faith in his death and burial and resurrection. Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our peacemaker. He's the one who humbly submit him, submitted himself to the will of the Father, becoming a servant who was obedient even unto death. And so today as we receive communion, I want us to remember how Jesus made peace for us at great personal cost to himself. He was betrayed. He was reviled. He was slandered. He was beaten. He was abused. And he did it for you and for me. 
He offered up his body for us. His blood was shed for us. He spared not his own life to make peace for us. But before we receive communion, can I just give you a pastoral admonition? In Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, Jesus said, If you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, not just uh, you got something against your brother, but even if your brother has something against you, Jesus says, uh, if you're leaving your gift at the altar, he said, leave it there, and then go and first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Maybe the most spiritual thing you can do this morning is to get up when we start communion and go outside and make a phone call. And it's the moment where you need to say, listen, you sinned against me, but I realize that I've sinned against Christ. In this moment, I just need to offer you the forgiveness that Jesus has been calling me to to offer that I haven't been offering. Or or maybe you need to call and apologize for the way that you've sinned against someone. If if you're leaving your gift at the altar, hey, hey, just leave it there and go be reconciled and then come and offer that gift. Jesus purchased our unity on the cross. Don't let sin or bitterness or unforgiveness leave you in slavery when there's freedom to be found in Jesus Christ. Forgive others as Christ has forgiven you. Here at Cross Community, we practice what we call open communion. Uh, It means you don't have to be a member of this church to participate in communion with us. We welcome any baptized believer to participate with us. If you're here and you aren't a believer, we invite you during this time just to remain in your seats while we receive the elements. And today, what I want us to do is you come forward, you receive the elements, take them back to your seats, and just spend a moment in prayer. Remembering the price that Jesus paid for your peace. Thinking about him as your peacemaker between you and the Father. Thanking him. If you want to take a moment, gather up your family, pray with them. Spend a few moments in prayer and then you can receive the elements right there in your seat. And we're going to close with a a song together. So let me pray for us and the deacons will be up here and they'll serve us. Father, first and foremost, we, we are thankful for your initiating work. Lord, we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were hopeless and helpless to do anything about it. We couldn't save ourselves. But God, you saw us in our sin and with love. You were moved with compassion and mercy for us. And you came and you rescued us at great personal cost to yourself. You went to the cross and you bore our sins. Lord, you, in your body, you endured incredible suffering for us. Your blood was shed and offered as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God, thank you that you made peace with us. And I pray that we would be a church full of peacemakers and thus a church of of unity. God, we thank you for that. We know it's your work in us. And we pray that you would bless even this time of remembrance. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I'm going to invite you to come up, receive the elements, go back to your seat, spend some time in prayer, and then receive those. And we'll close with a song.